Because the joy is actually a fruit of the Spirit. Galatians 5.22 talks about the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, all these great things. Joy is part of the Spirit. Amen? Amen. So we need joy. And if the enemy can take away your joy, he takes away a lot. Amen? We need joy. We need joy. We need hope. How many of you have just been so weak when you had no joy? Amen? Let's read here. James 1. He's talking about he's greeting the, the tribes. James, a bond servant of God, of the Lord Jesus Christ, and to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad. Now, when he uses this word scattered, I want you to understand that just because you're a believer, we're not sheltered. We're scattered abroad. He's talking to believers here. He's talking to my brother, believers. Many times I've said this, and I want to say it again so you get this, and you understand this, so when it does happen, you're not shocked. You're not unaware. But as a believer, you're not sheltered away from the things of the world. We're in the world. We're not of the world. Many times, some people want to believe that when they get saved, nothing bad ever happens. I will tell you, first of all, that when you get saved, the devil gets mad. The devil don't like it. And when you begin to fulfill the purpose God's placed in your life, calling just as they're stepping out by faith as a purpose and place in their life, the devil's going to do everything he can to raise his ugly head and take away their joy. Because when he takes away their joy, as I'm going to read in a little while, it removes their strength. Let's keep going here. He says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Now, I don't know about you, I like to just scratch that out. Can we just move that? Amen? Take that out. But count it a joy. Why? He says, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its, let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. This is interesting here. We've got to look at this really careful. God, listen, he wants us to be complete. He wants us to lack nothing. Anything that we stand in need of, he's going to tell us in a moment to ask. He goes on and says... If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberty without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith, with no doubting. For he who doubts is like the wind, the wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. Let him not suppose he gets anything, for he's a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Listen, when we begin to understand that anything we lack... Baby, can I get one of these right here, please? Thank you. You sure are fine. Amen. If you're visiting with us, I'm not making passes at the piano player. That's my wife. Amen. We already had that happen. Some lady left here. I said something to my wife. And the lady left here and says, oh, my God, that guy's a little too friendly with that piano player. That's his wife. It's okay. Amen. <laughs> we should not lack anything. God wants to provide. Look, we serve a good God. We serve a mighty God. We serve a God who knows things that we need even before we ask. But he wants us to ask. And as we ask, the Bible says if a son asks his father for bread, he don't give him rocks. If he asks him for something, he don't give him a serpent. Listen, my God that I serve loves me. And he wants good things for me. And you must see that for yourself. You must see for the fact that whenever you're in need, whenever you're in a situation where you cry out to the Father, it does not fall on deaf ears. It falls on ears that my Father hears and responds. And He wants to give you the joy. Let's just jump down a little bit further here. Over in verse 12, it says, Blessed the man who endures temptation. For when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those he loved. Verse 14, For but each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desire and enticed. He don't tempt us. Listen, here's what happens. We find ourselves being drawn away by the things that entice us the most. Come on. And sometimes things that entice us are not godly things. And those things that entice us that are not godly things, keep on reading what it says, will fall into will just basically death, spiritually die. Amen. We should be aware of the fact that anytime the enemy's trying to lure you away, 
He's got a trick up his sleeve. Amen? Now here's what happens. Many times we don't see it because we just come to a point where we just fall apart. Now let me read this to you because I want you to see a few things before I go any further. John talks about this in 1633. It says, These things I've spoken to you that it may have peace, that you may have peace. In the world you have tribulation, but be of good cheer. Be of good cheer. Why? I have overcome the world. Anytime you see these things, you've got to realize that everything that you're struggling, God's already overcome it. Amen? Even Acts talking about strengthening the souls of the disciples, exalting them to continue in the faith and saying, we must, we must, through many tribulations, enter the kingdom of God. You will go through situations. You will go through problems. We must go through them before we ever get to heaven. Now, Nehemiah says something here, and, and we have the governor, which is Nehemiah, and the prophet Ezra, and he's speaking here. And this is what he says. He goes on to say, Ezra the priest and scribe and the Levites who taught the people said to all the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn, do not weep. For all the people wept. It was a sad time when they heard the words of the law. And he goes on to say, verse 10, Then he said to them, Go your way, eat the fat, drink the sweet, send portions to those for whom nothing is prepared. He's telling us about giving right here. Prepare to those who can't do it for themselves. For this day is holy to our Lord. Do not sorrow. This is the part here that I get excited about every time I read this right here. Do not sorrow for the joy of the Lord is your strength. The joy of the Lord is your strength. So the Levites were quiet all the people saying, Be still for this day is holy. Be not grieved. And all the people went their way to eat and drink, sent portions, and rejoiced greatly. Why? Because they understood the words that were declared to them. Now, here's what happens. I can stand here, and I can proclaim the word of the Lord, and if you don't grasp it, and you don't understand it, or you think it's something that it's not, then you're going to struggle. When we walk into the sanctuary, we walk into the place where God's, hopefully God's word is being preached, when we stand in the pulpit or we sit in a pew and we begin to listen to the word of the Lord, the first thing we should do is say, God, give me understanding. God, enlighten me so I know exactly what you're trying to say to me. Because if you don't know, then chances are you will leave defeated. Because if the enemy can trick you and believe it is something that it's not, then you leave not only tricked but confused. See, any time we get into the presence of the Lord, God is not trying to trick us, not trying to confuse us. I preached a couple of weeks about our eyes to be open, our ears to be open, because God has a purpose and plan for all of us to understand. God wants us to know exactly what he's trying to say. He wants us to see it. He wants us to hear it. He wants us to understand it so we can operate fully in it. And I'm here to tell you this morning that if you get this, you'll leave here victorious. And this is the whole part, the whole message. I'm going to talk about a few more things. But the whole message I want you to get today is simply this. It's the joy of the Lord that brings strength. Let me say it again. It's the joy of the Lord that brings the strength we need to operate on a daily basis. Now, I know good and well the size room. We have people in this room today that you have spent time where you have been miserable. You've been just sorrowful. Something's happened. Something's taken place. That has just sucked the joy right out of you. And when the joy is taken out of you, then you become weak as a puppy. There have been times, even in my own life, where I have felt defeated. I have felt that the enemy has just was victorious. I have felt just destroyed by the enemy. Where you don't even want to get out of bed. Come on, somebody. Times, well, I'm talking to somebody. Look, I got the mic and you hear me. But I want you to know, there's people in this room that need to hear this. Because we know without a doubt, listen, if you can't get up and begin to fulfill the calling God has for your life, then the enemy wins. And the only way that we can do that is we have to have the joy of the Lord to give us strength to fulfill everything God set out for us to do. Amen? We need the strength. We need the joy. All through here, he talks about joy. Now, I remember this. Probably one of the first messages I preached when I returned back... I was invited to preach at a church on the coast down in Mississippi, and I was praying for a message. 
And God began to give me these scriptures. And this is really the part to hear that I, I was preaching from. And I took the word joy. J-O-Y. And I said, joy is Jesus on you. When Jesus is on us, we have joy. It's when we feel like we're missing something in our life, we lose that joy. Somebody said one time about the presence of God. Well, I'm not sure about the presence of God. Well, let me tell you something. When you're out of the presence of God, you know it. You know it. There's been times in my life where I have felt separated from the things of God because maybe of disobedience. Just maybe, you, just some, you know, sometimes we get so busy that we put God on the back burner. Come on. Am I talking to somebody? And anytime that happens, we feel defeated. Now, I'm telling you today, if you want joy in your life, you need Jesus on you. You need Jesus on you. You need, I, I remember, I, I, I said this this morning, and I kind of told off of myself, but I remember when I was in the world, we'd go to some parties, and you'd have jungle juice. Some of you don't shout me down, amen? Don't, so righteous, you never know what I'm talking about. But we'd have jungle juice, and jungle juice was really just a mixture of all kind of different things you put into one big pot, and oh my God, it would destroy you, amen? amen. It was a counterfeit joy. Come on. It was a counterfeit joy. Because I promise you, next morning when you sell in Buicks, y'all get that in a moment, amen? <laughs> so I hadn't heard that in a long time. But when you sell in Buicks, it ain't fun, Amen? <laughs> I'll, I'll leave that alone. Amen. But you know what we need? We need Jesus joy. We need Jesus juice. Amen. We need a good dose of Jesus juice. If we're going to survive, we need Jesus juice. And I believe with all my heart today that if we're not careful, the enemy steals our joy. Listen, there are people in this room that's been through some difficulties. There's some people in this room have lost some loved ones. There's people in this room have been through some, maybe it's a separation, maybe it's divorce, maybe, maybe some horrible things have happened to you. And if you're not careful, all that joy that you should have to serve the Lord just gets sucked right out of you. I'm here to tell you this morning, God wants to restore everything the enemy's ever taken away from you. Everything the enemy's tried to steal from you. Every counterfeit that the enemy's tried to place in your life, God is trying to give you the real deal. And the real deal is Jesus. The real joy is Jesus. The real hope is Jesus. Jesus is where you're going to find everything you stand in need of. I need Jesus on me. Amen? Amen. We look here and we see the battle. We know without a doubt the battle is overcome because Jesus teaches us that he's already given us the strength and power to overcome all these things. But what I want to show you this morning, I want to show you some things that we need the joy to give us strength to overcome. The first thing is this. We need joy to give us strength to stand. Amen? Just to stand, to stand firm, knowing without a doubt that the enemy's coming back. Isaiah even talks about it in one place. It says, my counsel shall stand. Anytime we go through anything, we can always stand on God's counsel, God's word, God's promise. God's promise never fail. When we stand on the word of God, we will never fail. One place here talks about uh, uh, Ephesians. It's talking about the armor of God. He says, finally, my brother, be strong in the Lord in the power of his might. It's not your might. Put on the whole arm of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against husband and wife. Come on, somebody. We don't wrestle against neighbors or boss. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against the powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Now, let me just back up a little bit right here. It says we wrestle against the principalities. If you take this word principalities and you really go back and you begin to study it, it breaks down to principles. Do you know that we wrestle against the principles of God? You know why? Because the world totally, totally twists everything that God wants for us. See, the devil cannot invent anything. The devil is not an inventor. A devil is a perverter. A devil will take whatever God did and try to pervert it, try to destroy it. And everything that the devil does, it, it wrestles against the principles of God. Because God is a God of principle. And if we wrestle against the principles of God, then we fail every time. Because God says it, and that should settle it with us. Amen? Now, one place we read here, it talks about, 
He says, wrestle against these things. And he says, therefore, take up the armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all, to stand. Now, I'm going to stop right there. And for those who don't know, this is a spirit-led church. I have a whole lot of message left to preach. But I'm going to stop right there because I feel somewhere in my spirit that somebody's struggling today. So let's just stop for a moment. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. I don't know what you're going through. Just, just give me a minute. No one leave. Just hang tight. But there's somebody here today, maybe more than one. Maybe some things have happened before you showed up today. Maybe some things happened in the park lot. I don't know. But the enemy is really doing a number on you this morning. He's doing a number to the point where instead of joy, you feel in really a lot of hate, a lot of pain, maybe disappointment, discouragement, just anguish. And I'm going to believe with you this morning that God is going to set you free. Before we go any further, I'm going to pray for you this morning. Heads bowed, eyes closed. I'm not asking anybody to look around. I'm not here to embarrass you, not here to call you out. I'm here to pray for you this morning. You're here today, and something has taken place. It could have been last night, but something has happened that is really trying to steal your joy. I'm going to believe with you this morning that the joy of the Lord is going to return back to your life, back to your situation. It could be financial. It could be emotional. It could be relational. It doesn't matter. We're going to believe together. God's going to restore everything the enemy's trying to take from you today. Heads bowed, eyes closed, no one looking around. If that's you this morning, right where you're at, just raise your hand. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. You can put your hands down. Oh, Father. First of all, God, thank you so much for being a God that gives us a spirit to lead and to guide us into truth. God, as I look around this room, I realize how needed this word is. And Father, I realize that whenever your people that are called by your name, God, there are times when they're trying to receive, but the enemy has just got them so deflated and so just battered and bruised. And God, we're going to believe together. As a body of Christ, you tell us with two or more come in agreement, you're here. And Father, we believe without a doubt that you're here right now. And God, as I look across this room and I see the sea of hands that were raised, God, I know that you want something to be done this morning. So Father, I ask you, I ask you in the name of Jesus, the name above all names, the name that knows no defeat, the name that has overcome the world, the name and the joy, the spirit that lives inside of us. God, I ask you right now to begin to touch every hand that was lifted. God, I pray today by the anointing and by the power of the Holy Ghost that you begin to touch each hand, each head from the top of their head to the sole of their feet. God, I thank you right now that the joy of the Lord is going to return. God, I thank you right now they're going to receive. God, I thank you right now they're going to be victorious. God, they're not going to fall into the victim category. They're going to fall into the victorious category. And God, I thank you right now they're going to leave this place victorious. Now, Father, as I continue this word, God, let it be fulfilled. God, let every word that comes out of my mouth be orchestrated by you, directed by you, as we honor you for your victory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Let's give God a hand. Amen. I was thinking about Julia saying, we need to bite the devil, amen? Every once in a while, we just need to stop and bite back, amen? He will not stop me from standing. Here's the next thing. The joy of the Lord gives us the power to trust. The Bible says in Psalms 18, verse 1, he says, I will love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress, may I deliver, my God, my strength, in whom will I trust? 
my shield, and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised, so shall I be saved from my enemy. Again, it says, my strength in whom I will trust. Many times the enemy is trying to take away your joy, and when he takes away your joy, he takes away your trust. Come on. If you don't trust, you can't receive the joy of the Lord. If you begin to trust in the things of the world, and oh, look, here's a, here's, a, here's a revelation for you. Ready? The joy is not determined whether you're financially successful or not. Your joy should not be taken away when you lose your job. Come on. Because when we begin to trust in the Lord, we begin to trust the fact that God says, I've never seen the righteous forsaken or seed, seed begging bread. We begin to trust in all these words of the Lord. Now, if we begin to lose that joy, then we lose that trust. Listen, maybe you're going through something right now and you're stepping out by faith. Maybe it's a new adventure in your life and you're trying to step out by faith. I promise you this morning, when you bring in the joy of the Lord and say, God, no matter what happens, I'm going to give you all the honor, glory, and praise. God, I'm going to begin to thank you for everything that takes place. You are my Savior. You are my King. You said you'll never leave me or forsake me. God, I'm going to believe those things. Then the trust that you have and need, you step forward. You begin to operate in that trust. We need the joy of the Lord for trust. And this next one here, for some, might sound a little strange. But the joy of the Lord gives us the strength to run. Now, when I'm talking about run here, I'm not talking about run because of fear. I'm talking about run because we're smart enough to realize if we don't run, we'll get in trouble. Come on. I'm talking about being able to run for something that when you realize that if you stay, you're liable to say the wrong thing. Come on. I'm talking about running... When you realize if you stay and you don't run from it, you're liable to do something you're going to regret. Come on. I'm talking about running. Listen, there's a story of a man that we all recognize because the Bible says that he had a heart after God. His name is King David. King David ran. He ran from Saul because Saul was jealous of King David. He wasn't king yet. He was, he was jealous of David. Because of what David was doing. Now, all of a sudden, Saul had all these people whispering in his ear, talking about what King David was going to do, he was going to destroy, he was going to take over the throne and all this stuff. So all of a sudden, now he realizes that he wants to destroy him, but David has a lot of people who really likes him, and he realizes if he does something stupid, that he's liable to really get in trouble. But David realizes it also, so David runs. Come on, somebody. The Bible says that David ran, and he's running in the desert, he's running away from Saul, not because he's fearful, because he's aware of his own capabilities in his life. So he runs from Saul. Now, by, the Bible has a way of really telling a great story, and God has a way of really showing you some revelational things here. Because all of a sudden now, David is running, Saul takes 3,000 of his top soldiers and says, hey, let's go find him. Let's go capture David. So now Saul is in the middle of the desert. He's going through the mountains. He's rushing. He's looking around, and he's hunting for David. Now, this is the Bible. This is not Bobby. This is Bible. All of a sudden, Saul, his stomach began to roar a little bit. Come on. And all of a sudden, the Bible says that he, had, he found himself in a place where he had to go use the restroom. That's what he says. Go read it for yourself. All of a sudden, now David, now Saul says, you know what? Hey, look, you guys, you, your army, y'all stay out here. Y'all go, look, I'm going to go up in the rock. I'm going to go up in that little cave right there, and I'm going to go ahead and take care of my business. He goes into the cave. Now, listen, let me tell you something. You can't make this stuff up. Amen? This is good stuff. He goes into the cave, and out of all the caves all over the place, Guess who's hiding in the cave? David. David's in the cave with his men. He's in this cave, and Saul comes to use the restroom. Now, all of a sudden, now listen to me, because, see, now David's men don't understand and don't have the wisdom that David has. So his men's saying to David, hey, you know what? 
The scripture is going to be fulfilled. He's put your enemy in your hand. Take him out. Destroy him. Kill him. But see, David understands that Saul is still God's anointed. Come on. And he understands that, you know what? To take place, to do what he's called to do at the time he's called to do it, if he does it wrong, it's going to haunt him the rest of his life. So that's why he runs. So all of a sudden now David finds himself with his men whispering in his ear saying, take him out. He's the enemy. God's delivered the enemy into your hand. David actually, what he does later on, he actually regrets what he does. But he goes, now there's Saul, and he's using the restroom, and David sneaks up where Saul don't even see him and cuts the hem of his garment, cuts a piece of cloth off his garment, slices it off. All of David's men is just sitting there thinking, dude, take him out. Destroy him. Kill him. Take him out. But David understands these things. And so all of a sudden, now Saul gets up. He finishes what he's doing. He leaves the cave. And David stands outside the cave with that piece of cloth in his hand. And he proclaims to Saul, Saul, does this not prove, does this not prove that everything they're trying to tell you is a lie? Does this not prove that, you know what, I'm not trying to kill you. If I wanted to kill you, I could have killed you in the cave. Come on, somebody. See, whenever we run, when we're supposed to run, God will deliver us exactly the time that he wants to deliver us, however he chooses to do so. In this particular case, it was kind of a strange scenario. But you know what? David did the right thing by running. Because if he would have stayed, he would have begun to listen to the wrong person, he would have made some wrong choices, and he'd done some wrong things. Sometimes in our life, if we're going to have the joy of the Lord, I don't know about you, but I need the joy to run. Come on, somebody. Listen, you might be in a situation. Let me just go a little bit further. I'm going to bring this into a, a little bit here in the now. Maybe you're working in a workplace that somebody's a little too flirtatious. You need to have the wisdom to run and move to another office. Come on. Maybe in a, in a workplace where some things are not operating under integrity. You need to learn to run. Maybe you find yourself because of some bad habits that you have in a place that would make it real easy for you to fall right back into those bad habits. Well, well I'm stronger than that. Are you really? Come on. Are you really? You better run. You better run. You see, wisdom is knowing your limitations. Wisdom is understanding that you're human. Wisdom is knowing the difference from being afraid and being smart. There's a huge difference. And I'm telling you this morning, it's the joy of the Lord that can rise up inside of you, that keeps you and it gives you the ability to get away from something that will destroy you. Wisdom. Here's the next thing. Is this. Joy will give you the strength to escape from temptations. And this really bleeds right into the last one. What do you mean by that, Pastor? Well, let's look at the Scripture. 1 Corinthians 10, 6. It says, Now these things became an example. And let's jump down to 10. 10. He says, Nor complain, as some of them also complain. It was destroyed by the destroyer. Now this is talking about the Israelites. When they came out, God provided them water. God gave them manna. When a manna was not good enough, God gave them quails. And they still complained. And he destroyed them because of it. Now all these things happened to them as an example. And they were written for, for us. Upon whom the end of the age have come. Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed, lest he falls. And that goes right back to what I said. When you think that you know what you're doing, and you're in the wrong place, you need to learn how to run, or you'll fall. No temptation, he says, has overtaken you except such as common to man. Somebody say, but God is faithful. But God is faithful and will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able but with the temptation, this is the part that I want you to see. But with the temptation, he'll give you the joy and the strength and the wisdom to make a way of escape. Now, many times, he says here, he says, uh, but with the temptation, we'll also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear, able to bear it. 
Now, what I'm talking about here is having the joy of the Lord to give you the strength to find that escape. Because the truth is, sometimes when we lose our joy and we find ourselves in some temptation, we can't find the escape. And all of a sudden, we find ourselves saying things like, well, you know what? I had no way out. Well, you know what that is? That's a lie. You were too weak to find it because you lost your joy in your relationship, maybe at home. Come on. You lost your joy in something that God was trying to give you joy in. Do you know how many people leave church because they lose their joy? Something happens. Somebody says something and just totally sucks the joy right out of you. And the truth is, most of the people that have said something, probably nine out of ten of them don't even realize what they've said. But we hear it because we're too weak to tell the difference between something that don't matter and something that does matter. But all of a sudden, we lose our strength, we lose our joy, and we find we have no way out. We find ourselves trapped. Now, my Bible says very plainly and very, very clear that any time we find ourselves in that situation, God always gives a way out. He always gives a way of escape, but we have to find it. Now, let me just keep rolling with this, okay? The next one is this. When we walk in the joy of the Lord, we can find the strength to be nice to our enemy. Now, I don't know about y'all, but that's a hard one. Amen? It's hard to be nice to your enemy. Now, what he says here over Matthew 5, 43, it's talking about love your enemy. He says, you have heard it said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemy, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. For he makes his son rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? Come on. If you greet your brother only, what do you do more than the others? In other words, do not even the tax collectors do this is what he says? Therefore you shall be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. Now, it's hard sometimes to be nice when you feel like somebody's not being nice. It's hard to be nice when you feel justified not to be nice. Now, I'm going to tell on myself, Kobe. We were traveling back from Mississippi. And I won't even tell you the name of the place because we won't, we won't give them any credit. But we stopped at a little fast food restaurant coming outside of Fidelia. And all the guys made their order. And I made my order, and I simplified it as simple as I could, because I, I like a burger, but I don't like everything on it. I like a simple burger. And so I ordered a burger the way I wanted it. So all the food came out, and my food came out, and when I opened it, they were spitefully trying to use me. Amen? It wasn't the way I ordered it. Now, that, it gets a little bit better. So I sent it back. And everybody else gets their food. And of course, Jeremy's over there licking his lip because he's eating all his food, you know. Not wanting to share it with me. I get that. I understand. I was trying to be Christian-like. So my burger comes back about 10 minutes later after everything. Everybody's almost finished their food. Comes back. I open it up. And it's not like I ordered it. Can I tell you how hard it was to be nice? But praise God, I had some joy, amen? Because it become funny at that point. Because pretty soon you got to get to the point where you got to laugh at yourself because you, you order something as simple as just meat, mayonnaise, mustard, pickles, and ketchup. I did not get offended because I had joy. Amen? Now, I'm talking to somebody today. Next time you go to a restaurant... Don't get all upset when it don't come the way you ordered it. Amen? Because I promise you, if it goes behind that wall, they might be doing something to your food you don't want to know about. Amen? 
<laughs> you're in a Cracker Barrel. I'm not in a Cracker Barrel. I got a reputation, amen? The point I'm trying to make is we have to learn to find that joy that gives us that strength to overcome those times when we really want to lose it. Amen? Because it don't pay you to lose it. Now, can you imagine if you lose it and all of a sudden, if I lost it, especially in Leesville, if I lost it and then somebody would say, aren't you the pastor of that? I'm like, oh my God. So I have no, I have no place to lose it. Amen? But the truth is, God gives us the joy and the strength we need to overcome any of those things that the enemy tries to steal from you. Amen? Really, the next one is simple as this, is we find real joy when we build our heart to the point it gives us strength to learn how to give. Even, even Nehemiah, when he talked about send the portions to those who without, don't have enough, he's teaching them how to give, the joy of the Lord there. Even Jesus himself spoke to us and said, remember the words of the Lord that he said, it is, best, it is more blessed to give than to receive. We need to learn how to Amen? The next thing is joy gives us strength to give our testimony. Do you know how hard it is sometimes to give you testimony? Yeah. Amen? I know for me in my life, there was part of my testimony that I didn't share for a long time. And the enemy tried to really do a number on me to finally one day I found freedom enough to share it. And now that thing has set me free to the point where I don't care. You know what? The Bible says we overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. And if we steal, if the enemy steals our joy to the point where we don't have enough strength to share our testimony... How many times are we really hurting people that need to hear our testimony? And so the, the God that I serve, the joy that he gives me, he gives me enough joy and the strength that in that time that I need to share my testimony the most, you have the power and strength to do so. Here's the last one is this. Joy keeps us from being ignorant of real hope. In Jesus. Thessalonians says this. It says, But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep. Least you sorrow as others who have no hope. Listen, I want to know that I have hope. I don't want to find myself in a place where I, all the joy and all the strength has zapped away from me until I'm ignorant of the hope that God has set before me. We all have hope. God gives us hope. Maybe you find yourself in a place this morning where you're having a hard time finding hope. Don't let the, 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 the devil bring you to a place where you don't understand it and he puts you in a place where you don't have it. God wants you to have hope. We need hope. I need hope. You need hope. There are people today, and I know that, that I'm going to probably touch on, on, on different people in this room because I think every one of us in this room has experienced this. Can you imagine somebody to the point in their life where they have lost all their hope, where they're willing to even take their own lives? Can you imagine somebody in a place where they find themselves so hopeless until they don't want to go on anymore? Can you imagine finding yourself... And listen, there's people in this room by the grace of God... That could be you. By the grace of God, the enemy could come and make you to the point where you're ignorant enough to know that he's going. There's a better, listen, listen, if, if you, no hope, just take your life and, and it's something better for you. That's a lie from the pits of hell. I believe this morning God wants us to know about his hope, about his peace, about his joy, unspeakable and full of glory. I was reading, and as I'm reading this story, I'm thinking about how even in the time that we should be the most joyous, even in the time we should be the most happiest, the enemy can do something so stupid to steal your joy. I was reading a story about a pastor who was performing a wedding. And it wasn't a very big place, and so a lot of people in the room knew each other, and they were all familiar with each other. And, and so this young couple is fixing to get married, and this pastor realizes he wants everybody to be a part of it. And so he says, I would like somebody to read 1 John 4, 18. 
And so he tells him to prepare himself when I call upon you to read that. Well, the person he asked didn't know the difference between 1 John and John 4.13 or 4.18. Now, this is what it's supposed to read. 4.18. There is no fear in love. But perfect love casts out all fear. That was, that's what it's supposed to read. John 4.18 read this. For thou hast five husbands, and he that is with you now is not your husband. This guy l- left the wedding without joy. Amen? Amen. <laughs> They are not married today, amen? <laughs> now, I don't know that, but I read that and I thought, you know what? That's a way the enemy can destroy you even in the time you're supposed to be your happiest moment. Here's a couple who sees love in their eyes and all of a sudden somebody reads the wrong scripture. Now, this is all coming from the Bible. And the guy leaves without any joy, amen? Amen? Father, I thank you for this day. God, I thank you for this time together. And God, my prayer today is that you touch the hearts of every man, woman, and child in this place. God, I know without a doubt that we need more joy in our homes, in our lives. We know the world is trying to suck out all the joy because of financial problems, because of emotional, because of physical, spiritual and God, I ask you today, God, to restore the joy of the Lord that brings strength. Heads bowed, eyes closed. I know I prayed earlier for some of you, but maybe something in this message really spoke to you. Maybe there's one of these parts about needing strength to help you during the difficult times. Whatever it may be, I want to pray for you this morning. If you're here today and you say, Pastor, Something you said really ministered to my heart, and I realize that's an area of my life that I need prayer. Heads bowed, eyes closed. If that's you this morning, right where you at, just raise your hand. We'll pray for you. Amen. You can raise it, put it up, put it back down. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Anyone else? Just raise it, put it up, put it down. Amen. Anybody else? Thank you, Jesus. I see those hands. Father. I thank you that it's your joy that gives us strength. And God, my prayer today across the sanctuary, God, there are those who find themselves struggling in certain areas. Well, God, I know that you're a God of hope. God, I know that you're a God of understanding. God, I know that you're a God that supplies all our needs according to your riches. God, I know without a doubt you don't leave us hanging. God, you always supply a way of escape when we fight faced with temptation. But God, whatever they stand in need of, God, I pray today by your anointing power that you fill them with your spirit, you fill them with your anointing, you fill them with your presence, and let them receive the joy of the Lord that brings strength. Let them receive wisdom to overcome whatever situation they're dealing with. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Maybe you showed up this morning. Maybe you realize today that you're lost in need of a Savior. Maybe you showed up today and you say, Pastor, I realize that I'm backslidden. I'm not where I need to be with the Lord. And I want to get my heart right. I want to get my life right. I want to get those things right today. Between you and the Father, from the heart, right where you're at, just begin to pray. Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Jesus, I repent. Jesus, I ask you to come into my life. Lord, I make you my Savior, my King. Jesus, you're my Master, my King. Jesus, thank you for saving me. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Maybe you prayed that prayer for the first time, or again, maybe it's a prayer rededication. 
Does it matter? I just want to pray for you. If you prayed that prayer right where you had to slip up your hand, put it up, put it down. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. See your hands all over. Thank you, Jesus. Anyone else? Thank you, Lord. God, I thank you right now that you're saving souls and changing lives. And God, I thank you right now that you're going to get them plugged into the right fellowship. God, get them restored. God, I pray right now that whatever they need, you're a God that provides. We honor you with your word. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you receive that word, let's give God a hand. Amen.